All right, I gotta put the goldfish down. <laughs> All right. What's loud? Um, I am an associate member of T3 Trading Group, which is an SEC registered broker dealer and member of Finra Sipic. You should carefully consider whether trading is suitable for you in light of your own financial condition. Here's my position disclosure. I think I got to say all this stuff before I can say anything. You guys can see, right? Because once again, I'm having this issue on my end, yeah. on my VTF, where it's just a black screen. Same thing happened yesterday at this time. I don't know what the deal is with that. Tech? Where's tech? Oh, yeah. They don't actually work here. Um. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, um, let's jump into it. So it should be showing a screen now. I should also be on, on YouTube now. Everything should be up. Um, oh, pricing. Oh, pricing. Amber just reminded me. Oh, pricing. Um, yeah, so again, you know, I hope all you guests are uh, enjoying the trial here for the week. You know, me and me and the team here are really trying to go above and beyond to give you guys an awesome experience. Um, I, I'm really hoping that a lot of you guys who have been here and are getting a lot out of this and, and guys who are asking good questions and, and gals, not just guys, it's just the New York and me speaking, guys and gals um, who are having a great experience and learning a lot and being involved in a lot of these these uh, names that have worked out pretty well for us, or at the very least, you're just learning. I hope that you, a, a whole bunch of you, stick around and really become part of the team. Um, uh, you know, like I said on the first day, the most important thing for me, and this is why I never wanted to previously push subscriptions for for ProDesk, is is I am have always been very afraid of losing the professionalism of the environment that we have here. But you guys have been great these these past three days. You know, there's been a lot of great communication, a lot of fantastic questions. So, um, you know, very little banter that I would count as, as negative. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, from what I'm seeing, you guys are all welcome to stick around. So reach out to the folks over at T3 Live, info at t3live.com, O pricing and um, become part of the team, become part of the team. Also definitely make sure to check out the at ProDesk VTF on Twitter and Derek the Trader on YouTube and, and, and all that good stuff. Um, you know, because it's it's not just the great call outs. We had some fantastic call outs today. It was a great t day for the team. But again, it's, it's the constant focus on, on learning and getting high level professional information in there that um, can help us all really be successful in this trading business. I love, I love what I do. I, I really love analyzing the markets on a day-to-day -day basis. When I'm right, when I'm wrong, um, it's, it's just such an awesome business. And I guess with that said, let's talk about how awesome we were because we were awesome today. Uh, we had some solid, fantastic trades. Uh, like always though, before we get into how great of a day today was, um, let's, let's always start with the big picture with the market, right? SPY is closing up a percentage point on the day. Q is closing up a percentage point on the day. IWM up 1.7%. Uh, let's talk about our, our technicals here and what they potentially mean for going forward. So we have now satisfied the oversoldness of the market, right? Monday, especially at lows, we were, we were discussing in the afternoon meeting on Monday that we closed extended the downside by about $10. At lows on Monday, we were extended the downside by about $15. Again, the way that I measure extension in the marketplace is where the market is trading versus the space between the eight and 21 EMA. So when I'm saying extension like that, I'm usually referencing what in this case would be what I call the lower band of equilibrium, which is the 80 EMA on that chart. 
Um, that's really how I utilize those moving averages. They're, they're tools. They're not support and resistance levels, though sometimes they can be a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy where you see the market perfectly bounce off a, off a squiggly line. At the end of the day, it's just a squiggly line. It's a tool, and that's the way that I use that tool is to help me measure extension. And by understanding extension, I understand probability. So um, the bears fought back on that overextension, which is really kind of what we expected. We got back to 440. Uh, we had spoken about in meetings the space between 440 and, and, and 442 is the area where I would really consider potentially starting to put on shorts or putting on hedges or lightening up on longs. And that's primarily what I did into this move today. Um, I didn't really initiate any new shorts or anything like that. It was more about lightening up on longs. So I took off uh, a ton of the VXX I had. I took off a bunch of the SoFi that I had. I took off a bunch of you know, exposure into this up move, which, which is exactly what I wanted to do. Because now, as of today's high, we're in a much trickier area. Um, this is where I think the key area it will be for what is going to define the trend, assuming that we are even going to have a trend, for going forward for this market, potentially even going forward for this market for the rest of the year. Um, now that we're no longer oversold, our bear is going to come in into this area, and, and that bounce that could really be as much as 445, but I think it'll be more of the 440, 442 area. Our bear is going to come back into this area and create a lower high for us that can lead to a lower low. If we lose Monday's low, if we create a pivot here and then lose Monday's low, that's really bearish short to medium term for this market. Big, big picture, we're still bullish. The 200-day is still rising. We're not even really near the 200-day. That's the uh, yellow line that I have here. Um, it's 200 days at 410 for the spies. But if we create a lower high here and then we break Monday's low, small picture, medium picture is looking really bearish. Um, so that that's kind of where we're at. I think big picture on the market. Bears need to try to come back in into this area to prove themselves. They were a little bit successful today with that rejection off 440, which is kind of what we expected. I know a few you guys um, shorted off 440 today, so it was a nice little trade there, especially just given the information that came from the Fed, uh, what I was really thinking, this is kind of what I was saying as I was reading it at 2 o'clock, was, all right, we're probably going to see a lot of volatility. I really wasn't believing that up move, but I didn't think that we'd see a major down move either. I think I said really early on when I saw the news coming out of the Fed, we'll probably close about where we started here, 4, 4.38. Right? Let me go to the five-minute chart so you guys can see. Um, 2 o'clock, where are we trading? 4.38. What does the Fed say? Again, did the Fed say anything that we weren't really expecting? The answer is no. I really think that everything the Fed said more or less met expectations of the market coming in. So with no surprise, I'm not really expecting a big directional move off of it, but I am still expecting volatility. So we trade higher to that 440. Some of you guys put on some nice little shorts here. Then we overreact to the downside. We trade down to 436.50. You know why is there usually an overreaction to the downside? Well, because all these people who bought here then become out of the money, so then they sell. Then that bounces back up again. Just volatility. Where did we close? Where are we right now? 438, basically on the dot right now. That really perfectly meets the expectation, and there, with there being no directional move and just that increase in volatility, with basically the Fed saying the things that we expected. Uh, and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back to the Fed. And we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes about specifically what they said. So that's our spies. Um, you know, cues here uh, very similar. If anything, the cues actually showed a little bit more relative strength to the market post two o'clock, and that is due to the fact that um, that the TLT was trading higher. So the IWM, even though the IWM is up most on a percentage basis, was weak to the Qs post 2 o'clock today, primarily because the TLT was ripping higher, which means that interest rates are going lower. And as Brant said, uh, really does not care about, the market really doesn't seem to care about tapering, or the TLT doesn't seem to care about tapering. Um, because tapering should bring the TLT lower, bring interest rates higher, at least in theory. Again, let's circle back to that in a second. 
Let's see if I missed anything on the big picture chart of the Qs of the IWM. No, Qs basically same thing, right? We're no longer oversold in, on the Qs basically as of today's high. IWM even overshot it a little bit. IWM over, fully filled that gap. It was primarily the relatively strong index today until 2 o'clock came around and was a little bit weaker. Um, so uh, IWM is still overall kind of in neutral territory. So that, that's the big thing, going back to the spies. Are we going to see a lower high come in or not? Or is it just going to be business as usual and we rip our way back up and go back to highs? Or the third thing that I mentioned that I know Brandon agrees with is the potential of sideways price action. Um, where maybe we don't really have a full breakdown, but we don't just rip back up and have all new, new all-time highs. We're up like, I don't know exactly what the percentage is, 18, 20% in the S&P on the year. That's a, if the year ends right now, this would go into the record books as an excellent year for the S&P. So maybe given where we are with valuations and upcoming tapering and then the eventuality of interest rates potentially getting uh, increased, um, maybe that just leads to sideways price action for a lot of the upcoming year. Look, sideways price action is never what we want for what we do. You know, professional trading, it, it, it definitely is not the best market environment, but we'll navigate it. You know, we have in the past, we will again in the future. We can always be focusing on the right stocks, really focusing on the names in play. And that was what we wanted to do today. It's difficult to really have a big belief in what the market's going to do on a Fed day. So we wanted to focus on certain stocks that we thought were going to be in play, right? We had SoFi, we had Hood, we had DNA, we had Snap. I mean, th th these were the names that were kind of on my radar today, and some of them turned out to be just phenomenal trades. Um, SoFi through 16, Josh was calling out that he was buying it. 16 bucks, we said, was this big level. Um, and it, it really cleared that in a major way very early on in the day. I know a lot of us on the team are involved in this beautiful follow through to above $17 and then spent the rest of the day digesting that gain. It's absolutely awesome trade there and snap phenomenal initiation. I think by JP Morgan for $25 today, that, that analyst over there, 17 bucks is the next resistance level, uh, from here in August. We now fully filled the earnings gap on SoFi and, um, it's a little bit extended on the daily chart. So trading at $17 with the ADMA at 1550, it might need some time. What I would love to see from SoFi more than anything else now is actually build out a tight, a tight flag for a couple of days, go sideways in the $17 area for a couple of days, set us up for continuation higher. If we can start really clearing this pivot, it's like 1750 or so, then it's starting to look, you know, pretty phenomenal again. So SoFi, fantastic trade. Uh, Hood today. Also a big focus, we spoke about a 43 buy in Hood in the morning meeting, um, basically opened up right at 43. I explained this trade with the screen share during the day today at one point because someone asked me about it. But very quick down tick at the open to the low of 42.76. You take your buy through 43 versus that low, you have 25 cents worth of risk. Trade ends up working out phenomenally well today. Um, you may have gotten pushed out in the 1110 pullback, which is what it is. It depends on how tight you are trailing. Um, you could have, and it would have satisfied my rules, my trailing rules, raised your stop to the second five minute bar low of the day, which is 43.52, in which case you do get stopped out here on this bar. You may have also cheated on the third rule of my trailing when this bar came in at 1030 and raised your stop for the first time to the 4356 uh, low here, in which case you also would have gotten pushed out. That's the danger of cheating on my third rule of trailing. The third rule of trailing that I have states that you need to have a new high in order to raise your stop to the pivot low. Um, my first two rules, which are pivot point and uh, ADMA catch up, I basically never cheat on those rules, but the third rule I will occasionally cheat on. And we spoke about in real time that you could, if you wanted to, on some of your position, because of this positive green bar, cheat on the third rule, in which case you got pushed out of a trade that otherwise continued to work. So if you did not raise your stop to the second five minute bar of the day, if you did not cheat and raise here, then you do have stock here into the end of, into the into the close, or 
Another thing I like to do um, when I'm trailing really tightly for some of my position, and by the way, I, I would call raising your stop to the second five-minute bar low here uh, a really tight trail, and this is a cheat. Sometimes what I do is I'll, I'll just raise up a percentage of my position. So I say to myself, you know what? I, I don't want to just sell all my stock because I want to give it the chance to be able to work out, but I don't want to give everything all the way back either. So let me do kind of a happy medium thing of my remaining position. Maybe I'll raise my stop on 25 to 50%. I'll keep it really tight or I'll cheat on 25 to 50% of my, my position. And the remainder of that position, I'll, I'll, I'll really stick with the rules and I won't raise the stop. I'll keep it at lows. So what may have happened to a lot of you, which I actually think this is a great thing, is that you got stopped out of some of your position into this down tick at 10 after 11. Some of your position you're keeping because you're not getting stopped out because it never breaks that opening low. And then eventually you're actually able to raise your stop to this low and then it gives continuation. New highs come in. Eventually you can raise your stop to the 44 low uh, from 2 o'clock today, which is like the, the Fed announcement down tick low. Eventually you could probably raise your stop here to, to 250. By this time of the day though, I'm probably also really looking at a 15 minute chart for trailing. And if you're looking at a 15 minute chart, there is nowhere to trail on a 15 minute chart until you raise your stop to the 11.15 low. And you only do that at 1.30 when, when the new high comes in. And you still have stock at 47. You still have stock into the close here at 47 when it closes this well on highs. You probably wanna swing some of that position. Short term target of 50, bigger term target of who knows. It's a recent IPO. and was only above 50 into this kind of insane pop that it had uh, back more immediately after the IPO. So that was the hood trade. Also, great call out today from the team. Um, DNA was one of the ones that was on my list today. This DNA was not fantastic, and that's why I pulled away from it and I didn't actually trade it. I had an interest in DNA above yesterday's high of $12.40. Not, you know, not seeing the volume I want to see early on. So I ended up not taking the trade. I think a couple of you guys actually still got into it through that area. Um, and it did wake up on some volume, which is exactly what you want to see uh, around 1030 or so. So if you took that trade, it, it's one of those that was kind of similar to a plug from yesterday where it definitely works enough where you at least should be, depending on how greedy you are, in a worst case scenario, you should be at a donut at the end of this trade at, at zero PL. Meaning you were super greedy and it pulled back and you did enough to be able to cover your risk, but you didn't actually make money in it. And it ended as a zero, <clears throat> which again, I'll take zeros all day. I'll take zeros all day because you only need a couple of trades to actually really work out well for you um, if everything else is a zero and you're making good money consistently in the long run. Um, so that's DNA, depending on how greedy you are. Uh, what? Oh, it's Snap, right? Snap was also a big thing on our radar based on the price action from yesterday. We've been seeing option flow come in on this. We actually got a gift in this Snap, and I mentioned that in the morning meeting with the fact that Facebook got hit with that bad news, and they ended up opening Snap down today because of it, just to rally it all the way back up. Uh, the Snap, I have thought, has been a phenomenal chart, even though it spent a couple of months here digesting that earnings report. This is a phenomenal chart on how this has held up and how this has created the $70 support. And that was after a fantastic earnings report that it had back here at the end of July. Um, so this was totally on our radar today for continuation through 76. It did that. You could have even been in earlier before 76 because of that gap down. Clo you know, went to, to almost 80 bucks today. So, so just fantastic. Um, awesome stuff and, and I love I love more than anything else. I know a bunch of these ideas have worked out really well were my ideas, but not entirely. I mean, uh, the whole reason why DNA is on my radar as an example is, is, is from Josh. But I love more than anything else when the team, when you guys, not just me, are providing the ideas that make the team as a whole money. It's a, it's a give and take, you know. Um, when I first started my own professional trading desk with T3 Trading Group back in 2013, uh, you know, it, it, it was um, a struggle a little bit because it was myself and, and, and one other guy who was also, who was a really excellent, you know, experienced trader. 
uh, but everybody else was like brand brand new like didn't know anything and it's so awesome that we've been able to build over time a team where a lot of you guys have just a, a fantastic amount of experience and you know we can all feed off of each other and some of you guys even started like you know Felipe Patrick uh, started with me directly out of college you know just just learning everything from from the get-go and now you guys make the team a lot of money and it's um and and you know making money for yourselves too obviously so you, so you love to see that type of growth and it's just created a fantastic team so anyway i'm not going to ramble on too much of it but just become a part of it and you'll be able to be part of a great great squad that we have here um so those are that's the market as a whole those are the individual stocks i really wanted to talk about it's been a little bit more time talking about the fed so it seems like the Fed said more or less what was expected. So the tapering is going to start soon, maybe even as early as next month is kind of what I'm reading between the lines. Whether or not that actually happens is to be determined. He's saying it, that he is expecting the tapering to be complete by the middle of next year. Let's just assume June to keep that simple for the moment. And of course, it never is simple, but let's just try to keep this as simple as possible for the moment. And then only after the tapering is fully complete will the Fed consider start starting to raise interest rates. So it seems like the dot plot or whatever is starting to ex expect interest rates to increase um, at the end of 2022. And then in 2023, they're saying the potential of three interest rate increases. Again, on the one hand, it seems like these dates are right around the corner. You know, the tapering is going to be done in less than a year, uh, which is, on the one hand, you got Powell saying it's, it's going to be a very slow come off of the tapering. On the other hand, if you're telling me that you're not starting till October, November, December, but you're going to be done by June, that seems pretty quick to me. So we'll see. I, I've also seen just a lot of the times over the years now of, oh, we have these dot plots where... You know, two years from now, it's probably going to be three or four interest rate hikes. I mean, even Powell himself was doing that. And then how many interest rate hikes did Powell actually do? Was it one, I think? Was it two? It was only one or two. Um, and then, you know, it was, just, it was the end of the world, of course, when he actually did that. Uh, so we'll see. I, I am a proponent, personally, of starting to do this sooner rather than later and I said the same thing back in 2013 that we should start increasing interest rates back in 2013 just because you know the economy is running along fine the markets are at all-time highs and and the thing is that we need to almost like reload our gun in case the next crisis occurs and that, that's the biggest thing I was saying and honestly the biggest thing coming into coronavirus is we couldn't really lower interest rates coming into coronavirus because we are already as low as possible. So then the only other tool I have is to then come in and do absurd amounts of, of, of um, quantitative easing and asset purchases because we don't have a, a gun that's loaded with bullets for the Fed because we never actually reloaded it when times were good. And times were pretty good starting in 2013. We easily could have slowed it down even if it was just a quarter of a percent to a half a percent a year starting in 2013 through when the coronavirus actually hit, it would have given us, you know, a, a little bit of ammo into when, when the virus situation actually negatively impacted our economy. But instead, we're just in this scenario where, you know, interest rates are, are at zero forever and, you know, we just got to buy and buy and buy. And again, it almost feels to me like money's not even a real thing anymore when you're talking about the trillions of dollars that we spend on certain things, right? It, it's like I said, and it's only a half joke. I wish it was a full joke, but it's really only a half joke. It's almost like money, money is only real to the people who actually can only have a limited supply of it and need to, and need to utilize it to buy groceries. For all the rest of, for, all, for everything else, for the Fed, for the US government, for everything else, it's almost like money is not even a real thing anymore. Just, just don't tell the foreign purchases of, purchases of our debt that. Um, anyway, uh, so, so what does all this actually mean to trading in the markets, though? Right, that's what we need to be concerned about. So, um, 
you got two things. You got tapering and you've got the Fed actually increasing interest rates. In theory, at least, and in practice it could be different, in theory, um, tapering should increase interest rates. Well, what did the TLT do today? TLT ripped higher, right? But, I mean, what are we up, really? TLT's up 0.65%. Um, so, okay, fine. TLT is moving a little bit higher. Interest rates are moving lower. What? You know? <laughs> uh, and again, it, it's, it's only 0.7%. It's not the biggest move in the world. But if this imminent tapering is coming and the market is a forward-looking mechanism, shouldn't the TLT be going down, which means that interest rates should be going up, right? A lot of the times... The theory and the practice when it comes to this stuff are, 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 are actually pretty different. And that's also kind of what I was alluding to a little bit earlier in the morning meeting where it's like, is, is there any chance where tapering happens and the market actually breathes a sigh of relief on that because of it, because we're actually going back to something that's a little bit more normal. It's just a, uh, it's just a thought, not a prediction. Um, we don't have a lot of historical tapering to really be able to look at to see in history statistically what the market usually does. We do have a lot more data on what happens when the Fed increases interest rates. Uh, but we did have a, a taper tantrum at one point in the past when it, when it came to the market. I'm trying to remember when that was. Was that the 18 pull, the, the, the pullback here at the end of 18? Or was that actually the increase in interest rates? Or maybe that was the early 18. I'm trying to remember exactly which pullback that was. That was the taper tantrum. Um, it was the end of 18. Thank you. Uh, uh, where we had like the taper tantrum. And um, the market actually pulled back really hard on that. So, I mean, we do have that data that the market really didn't like when all of a sudden the government wasn't buying bonds anymore. But there's also data that shows historically when the Fed increases interest rates that the first, like, three, I think it is, um, interest rate hikes are actually correlated with uh, also a move higher in conjunction with the market. And then it's only after you get past, I think, three, might be four interest rate hikes that the um, market actually starts to view that negatively. And again, if you really want to take an even bigger step back on it, um, it, it has to do with the free rate of money. You know, like, so uh, the free rate of money is what treasuries pay out. So, I mean, what <laughs> TLT is, is what, like a percentage point or something like that? So, I mean, I don't know. Does anyone here want to own a whole ton of um, treasuries for a return that is less than inflation? I don't. But what if, what if you could magically tomorrow get a risk-free return at 6%? Would you keep your money in the stock market? Like the U.S. equity market has a, a historical return of, you know, 7 8%, but with a whole ton of volatility and risk? Would you rather have your money in the stock market where maybe you can get an extra percentage point or two, but with all that volatility and risk? Or would you rather be able to get 6% from the government for free? Right? And a lot of people are going to say that they'd rather have a risk-free rate with the 6% guaranteed. Of course, right? So you, I'm using that 6% as a little bit more of an extreme number because I know what people's answers are going to be um, to try to illustrate a point. At a certain point, the higher that interest rate becomes, the more attractive that number becomes, and the less people want to have their cash in the actual stock market when they could get a really good risk-free rate from the government. So what that in turn does is it brings down the PE multiple of the market. Um, so the market, because interest rates have been so low, has been trading at a elevated PE for a significant period of time now. Um, and, and, and the really interesting thing is that we have seen the forward PE multiple actually decline this summer. Uh, Pat, in one of his notes, he's posted a couple of times in his note, the chart of the forward PE actually coming down even as the market went up. And that's because the last couple of our earnings seasons were, were, were so strong for stocks. 
Um, so that's interesting as well. Uh, but those are all the things that we need to think about. And the other thing that we need to think about is if interest rates do increase, what does that mean? Who's that good for? Who's that bad for? Well, a lot of the companies that exist right now would not have been able to come into existence at all, in my opinion, had it not been for the fact that money's been free for so long. Think about all of the companies that have been able to operate at a huge loss for so long just because they're able to just keep raising more and more money almost for free with the promise of, well, someday down the road, we'll actually start to think about profits. And it's all the tech companies. So, you know, Uber, Tesla, would those companies even be able to be companies if, if they weren't basically born in an environment where interest rates were basically zero? It, it, it's debatable, right? Some of these companies for sure probably would not, would not be able to be around. But if all of a sudden money costs money and you can't continue to operate at a loss forever because it's too expensive to, to raise the money for your ongoing operations. But right now, while it's free, it's fine. So, so generally what you should expect to see is as interest rates do move up or if interest rates do move up, then a lot of those companies, they better figure out a way to be able to get profitable pretty quick or they're gonna be in, in big trouble. Um, so higher interest rates tends to be worse for tech companies. It tends to be worse for, for the Qs. It tends to be better for value, for financials, right? Financials are the obvious case in point, right? Because they, they make their money off of there being a high interest rate. Um, so that's all the stuff that we need to think about. But to directly answer like the question that I know Robert had, had earlier, because he wanted me to speak about this, is, well, what does the U.S. market, what does the S&P market, the, the S&P market, what does the S&P actually do when tapering really begins? The, the direct answer is I really don't know. Um, I really don't know. I don't think we've seen it happen enough times in history to, to really have too close of an idea of it. And um, that's kind of why I was having that thought process in the morning meeting today of, well, what if the market's happy to see some sort of return to, norm to, to normal? Like, it, 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 it's, it's uh, the degree of free money out there and the amount of, of purchasing that's going on by the Fed, I think, is starting to create problems. Like this, you know, kind of housing boom that we're having and, and a lot of other stuff, and, and maybe that can, can begin to normalize. It, it's, it's, it's enabling some of these PE funds to just be sitting on just disgusting, disgusting amounts of cash. Um, so I, I, I really don't know, and I don't even fully know, I don't even fully know, even though in theory, if tapering occurs, interest rates should go up, I don't even know if in practice that's actually gonna happen. Case in point is, is what the TLT did post two o'clock today. So, the direct answer is I, I, I don't know, Robert. We're gonna have to see. And the thing that we always want to, to be paying attention to is our technicals. Our technicals in the market will give us those clues. So we'll pay attention to it kind of as it comes and, and we'll digest that new information. This is a long game, right? We're talking about our trading over the course of the rest of 2021 and you know at least the first half of 2022. And between you and me, I'm gonna be personally surprised if the way the dot plot is right now is perfectly met by the Fed and, and everything that Jerome Powell said, and it happens to be that we're, we're, it's the end of 2023 and we've had five interest rate hikes and or four interest rate hikes, four or five, and, and that there's zero tapering and everything else. And it's so hard to say. Who knows, you know, the next black swan type coronavirus thing that, that could happen where all of a sudden all of this is off the table again and once again we don't have any new bullets because we never reloaded our gun so that is that and it's pretty much all i've got so i'm gonna scroll through the vtf here and look for questions i'm gonna go back to like 410 or so first thing i'm seeing here is from amber at 406 on the o pricing reach out to info at t3live.com um 
then there was Robert's question. So that that's what I was just talking about. So we caught we we caught that. Still seeing disclosure. You're not showing charts, man. That's. Uh, are you guys able to see charts now? It didn't really matter for the stuff that I was talking about. I guess you can. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what's been going on with um, my technology here. Would have been embarrassing if I just did all of that chart review and you guys weren't actually seeing charts. I would have had to do the whole meeting all over. All right. Josh asking about BlackBerry. That's the first question I'm seeing. Is BlackBerry doing this after hours? Is BlackBerry have earnings? 10%. BlackBerry is not heavily, oh, it did have earnings. Just so you know, BlackBerry is actually not that heavily shorted anymore. Um, doesn't mean it, it, it's shorted enough where it could still have a squeeze, but it's not like it, what it was, um, you know, back the last time that they actually squeezed it. Seeing some chatter here with the trader counselors still scrolling through. What? Uh, so, question from Ocean Grown: What time frame does your third rule apply to? Uh, the answer is the time frame to which you are trailing, right? So it should be part of your game plan when you are in a with trend trade to figure out what you want to do for profit maximization. I'm a big believer in implementing trailing stops for profit maximization. And the degree, so the larger the time frame that you trail on, basically the more you're willing to give back of your profits to potentially make even more. So it's very rare to see a five minute chart have a perfect five minute uptrend all day. If you're trailing on a five minute chart, you are almost always gonna get stopped out at some point during the day on that stock. And it doesn't mean it's a bad thing to trail on a five minute. It just means that it's a tighter trail, you're probably gonna get stopped out, but you're still giving it the room to be able to continue in your, in your favor and uh, make you more money. And again, I love risking money that I've already made in order to make more. And, I'm, and maybe I haven't said this over the course of the last couple of days, but uh, I, I actually hate risk. Um, I'm a professional trader. I'm, I'm a professional risk taker. I sit here all day putting risk on. I hate putting on risk. That, and what I mean by that is that first moment where you press the buy button, there's a real chance you just bought that absolute top and it comes down and it stops you out and you lose your money. I hate that. I hate that. And we work in a game of probabilities, so it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We try to make sure, make sure it doesn't happen too often, but it's going to happen. I hate putting on risk, but I love risking the money that I've already made in order to make more. I will risk sums of money that I've already made in order to make more that are a huge multiple compared to the amount of money that I'm willing to risk initially on any trade that I put on. And when you're implementing a trailing stop strategy, you are risking the money that you have already made in order to potentially make more. That's what you're doing. The larger the time frame that you're trailing on, the more that you are willing to risk in order to potentially make more. So it's based on your game plan. You know, if I've got a thousand shares of a stock and I'm planning on trailing it, maybe you know, three, four hundred shares, I'm going to trail on a five minute chart, and I have no problem with the fact I'm probably going to get stopped out of it because I want to put that money in my pocket. And then maybe, you know, another few hundred shares, I'm going to be trailing on a 15-minute chart. There's a much better chance that a 15-minute chart trend lasts the entire day and I don't actually get stopped out. Uh, but I'm still, you know, trying to raise that stop loss to be able to lock more money in. And then maybe, you know, another 200 shares of it, I'm trailing on an hourly, which is going to be even wider. Or some of it, I'm saying, you know what, I'm giving back to my original stop loss no matter what today because I love that daily chart so much that I want to swing this if it can close well. And I don't want to get pushed out like some people might have in hood today by that one quick little downtick that's occurring at, at, at 10 after 11. So again, the answer to your question is what time frame does my third rule apply to? It applies to the time frame in which you are trailing it on. Um, Greg cheated and he got pushed out. Uh, so did Sebastian. It's okay. Um, <laughs> I should join the Fed. Thank you for that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that one as a compliment, I think. Oh um, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, NAMCAP, the, the whole idea of inflation is is to keep people spending, right? Um, which, you know, obviously um, the, uh, what's the official economist term that I'm looking for here? The, 
the the flow of money, right? The amount of time a dollar changes hands over time, speed, you know, moving that along it is good for the economy. But yeah, they that that's mainly what they want. They don't want people sitting on um, cash in their mattress or whatever. They want to keep the economy moving. That's that's why uh, basically inflation exists. Um, Steve from Denver totally think the delay in raising rates is because even though the Fed supposedly separate yeah yeah it's it's true um, again I, I I try yeah and that's uh, what Steve what you said there I think is is a hundred percent accurate um, one of the big problems with with rising interest rates is going to be servicing our own debt and when you know how much in debt we are and all of a sudden that costs us, it's, it's just like companies. But the difference between us and companies is that we can print money. So we can print money, we can inflate, inflate it away, uh, but that then costs, causes a, a whole host of problems. So if we can just kind of keep the grand experiment going and keep all of us going, then, you know, that'll be that. Um, yeah, 31 trillion. Yeah, it's sick. Uh, I forget what the percentage is of the of the budget is is actually paying off um, our debt, but it, it's uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, it's the grand experiment, right? Like I, I'm, I, I <laughs> Rowan loves to um, joke that I'm a permable, but it's kind of interesting because it's like I'm a permable and a perma bear at the same time. Because in the long, 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 long run, is this really going to be able to work out? <laughs> I don't, I don't know, but. The technicals keep saying higher, and being long has been a lot easier than, than being short. And on, if the entire monetary system implodes, then my money's worthless anyway. So I might, I might as well be long and keep going for that ride. Um, cool. Scrolling through here. Looking for questions. No problem, Robert. Would you consider tomorrow a short opportunity tomorrow on a on a on spy once the gap is filled? Um, if we gap up big tomorrow, Tommy, it, it could be a short. Yeah, so get exactly the area that you're talking four forty one to four forty three. I've been saying four forty to four forty two. We also have to keep in mind that ranges are wider now after opex. So when those ranges widen up, I, I, I sometimes actually am a little. I'm consistently a little bit off sometimes when the market's moving like this. I'm consistently a little bit early on my numbers. Uh, so I know myself well enough to know that if I'm saying 440 to 442, it might end up actually being as high as like 443 to 445. But it, it's it's that area that we really need to be watching for sure. Uh, next from Gabriel, would you, would an ad, would an ad of what was sold on hood in that pullback would be reasonable? We're too big of a pullback to add. Um, if I understand your question properly, you're talking about adding on this pullback. I don't think that there's a way to add on this pullback. There's no technical setup to add. Now, again, um, Gabriel, I know, I know you're on the team. Um, so uh, I spent previous meetings the last couple of weeks talking about the difference between an ad and an ad back. An ad is when you're taking on new stock. Add back is when you're taking back stock that you sold at a previously higher price. I see no way to do an ad here, but you could have done an ad back, meaning you sold stock into this move up to you know $45, and now you just you said, you know what, I'm gonna add back some of that stock I sold up at 45 at 43.50 or 43 quarter or whatever versus this low because I'm going to be profitable no matter what and it gives me the opportunity to work the position back and forth for cash flow. I do that a lot. Um, and if it goes all the way down and stops me out, okay, back, fine, I gave back a little extra profit than I would have otherwise, but I still made money. And if it gives me some volatility in this area and doesn't actually totally fail but it ranges out or something like that, I can actually make a lot more cash flow in the process. So I don't think you could do an ad here, but I think you could have done an ad back. Uh, next from T. Jones, could you comment on individual stocks, 50 to 60% of the stock? Yeah, so I've, this is another thing I've spoken about, not this week, but a, a lot of times recently in the VTF. Let me, let me finish reading your question, though. 50 to 60% of stocks have had a major decline in the last six months, although spying because they're all-time highs. With a handful of leaders propping up the market, uh, possible the correction started a couple of months ago. The top of the market was in February. 
The top of the market was in February. I've been saying this, just not for the spies and the queues, but for most stocks and for the the spec the speculative part of the marketplace, we topped back in February. There are all of those speculative stocks that we're paying attention to are down 50, 60, 70, 75% off their highs. All those highs were in January, February, um, and, and most stocks that you type up are nowhere near, they're in bear markets. Many stocks that you type up are in bear markets, and that has been one of the big conundrums for me on this market that I spent a lot of time talking about and a lot of time thinking about. Because the question is that I, I, I struggle to wrap my head around is what do those stocks do if the market itself actually breaks down? Because on the one hand, I'm looking at stocks that are, you know, so first of all, back in February, I was telling everybody that, that the market, that, that it was a bubble. All those stocks that were wiling out, um, the marijuana stocks, the 3D printing stocks, Palantir, uh, you know, that, that whole big list that we have, they were in true bubbles in, in February. It was an actual bubble. And I didn't think the U I didn't think the S and P was in a bubble, but I thought those stocks were. So it definitely makes sense that that bubble burst and it came down a lot. Um, but even if you're not even comparing it to the all-time highs for most of those stocks in February, even if you look at uh, just where those stocks were trading, like in in June, July, a lot of them were off by 50 percent. And and that's really kind of where the conundrum comes in because I'm like, all right, what do these stocks do if the S and P and the Nasdaq have a real correction? It, it, it's a really difficult question to answer um, because on the one hand, these stocks are in, in bear markets to the degree where you want to be the dip buyer because it's, it's, it's a massive bear market and they're at a huge discount. On the other hand, um, correlations in the market where if they start selling off the entire market, they could wreck those stocks even further. And again, a, a lot of those stocks never belonged at the prices that they were at to begin with is a, is a big thing. So I don't want to overly think about the fact that this thing is 75% off highs. Some of those names I don't think should ever see their February highs probably ever again in all of history unless the future of the future of history, is that a term? Uh, unless, um, you know, they really are able to be industry transforming, but, but, but most won't be, right? So uh, yeah, for, for, for sure. And that's, that's kind of been the big conundrum on it and, I, and I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, so that's why I, you know, I focus on a lot of those names. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. If, you, if you've got thoughts on it, I'd love to, to read them and hear them because I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. Uh, next from Sebastian. What do you need to see in a trade in order to add to your position or rebuy everything that you sold? Uh, okay, so this kind of goes back to what I was just talking about to Gabriel. There's a difference between an ad and, a, and, a, and, a, and um, an ad back. So an ad back is what you're describing as a rebuy of something that you sold initially. Um, I take ads as different trades, meaning I started with a thousand share position, it's going, whatever, and now I think I could take a, a new buy here for another thousand shares. That that I view that as basically an entirely separate trade. And if I take a new trade where I'm putting on new real risk, I don't ever let that new trade affect the original stock that I had if that makes sense. They might as well be two different stocks. Might, one might as well be Apple and one might as well be ExxonMobil. Um, I'm never going to uh, let that new trade, I just have this separate risk on this new trade, I get stopped out, whatever. If I work, it's great. Now I'm basically managing two different trades in the same stock. It's different than an ad back. I do a lot of what I call ad backs, where I, I sell stock per my game plan and then I'll I'll rebuy that stock into a dip, and if my trade fails, I'm losing my risk minus the difference in, in what I made in between, right? Like if I stole the stock at $50 and I rebuy it at $49.50, and then I get stopped out, I'm losing my original risk less than $50. So it's like I put, and, and assuming 100 shares, and so it's like I put that $50 from that 100 shares like in, in my pocket. Um, so I do a, a lot of, of ad backs in my trading. I mean, uh, you know, here, here's just my, my SoFi today with my, my executions. You see green and 
red dots all over the place. You can see me taking stock off and me kind of rebuying some of that stock into that dip, rebuying some of that stock into that dip, rebuying some of that stock into the dip. That's all just trying to, those are not ads, those are ad backs where I'm trying to create cash flow for myself on, on the execution of the trade. Um, it's a good question there, Sebastian. Uh, ocean grown with a follow up on trailing. Uh, do you still trail your s stop on peekaboo moves or keep it where it was? I don't know what that means, peekaboo move on um, in, in trading. That's uh, I just know like the little little kids game, <laughs> little baby baby game peekaboo. Uh, so I'm not really sure what you mean by that. Um, you might be referring to what I call like a false pivot point in the market, but I'm not really sure. It's kind of a complicated answer. I get into it in my training program in the game planning class where I talk about my three rules for trailing. Uh, so I really will only raise my stop or I only should raise my stop uh, if all three of my trailing rules are, are, are actually met. And if it's a peekaboo move like you're describing, then that usually means that the ADMA equilibrium catch up on the pivot wasn't met. But regardless, maybe what you're talking about is just like a little quick tick to new highs. That still satisfies the rules, and I would raise the stop on that. Um, velocity of money. Yeah, there we go. Money velocity. Thanks, guys. Money multiplier. Money velocity. Uh, Tommy, Derek on. Last question before I head to work. Uh, do you use multiple time frame charts? Yeah, 100%. You got you to gotta be looking at multiple. I, I at all times have at a minimum at all times I have my daily chart, my five minute chart, my 15 minute chart up at a minimum at all times. And and also charts of the spies and the queues at a minimum, if not more. Um, time frame continuity is a really important layer of probability. Uh, yeah, Mr. Steve, it's sad but true, right? Like the Metallica song. Thanks for the share there, Christian. <laughs> You're fired. We did have to fire the lots guy, though. Uh, from PG. That's an inside joke. If you know, you know. Uh, PG. Uh, how are you going to feel when you have non-professionals added to your team and may have to ask questions about your courses that may need help in real time during the slower time of the day? I mean, I'm, I'm here to help. You know, the best time to ask questions is really always going to be in the afternoon meeting. Um, you know, I, I, I've been on the radio, just so you guys are aware, a little bit more than I usually am. Uh, usually midday I have to do some other responsibilities that I have over here at T3. Uh, but I'm always at least available in the chat basically all day, every day. And n n newbie beginner questions are very welcome. You know, we have guys of all different experience levels here on the team. And if someone's asking a beginner question, it's just a great opportunity for the experienced people to review their fundamentals. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the fundamentals. Uh, Amar asking, saying, hi, I'm new here. Is this considered a day trading room or more of a swing trading room? It's both. It's both. We do both day trading and swing trading. I personally do a lot of swing trading where I, I very actively day trade around those swing positions. I do a lot of that. Um, next from Steve, OSTK. Yeah, I, I, you know, OSTK is another one of these companies. I, I really like some of the stuff that they're doing, and it just hasn't been able to wake up in a big way. But looking at this chart today, um, look at that breakout. Yeah, solid on OSTK today. Current above 74. I like how this looks. We should add this to our radar. A um, little bit of bigger volume would have been nice. Scrolling through here. No problem, Tommy. Hope to see you on the team. Robbie, can you show multiple charts on the screen? We can see. I don't think so. Not unless I'm like, you know, taking taking a couple of screens and uh, and, and overlaying them on each other. But uh, honestly, um, even though I've been sharing my screen and I've been doing that just in general recently. I personally don't think the screen share is necessary. 
Uh, I know it, it looks good, and if it helps people, I'm happy to do it. Um, but I, when, when we're communicating about a stock, you should be typing it up into your own software and trying to hear and see for yourself what we're talking about. And then if you need clarity, if you say, hey, Derek, can you show me on the chart? Okay, fine, I'm, I'm sharing the screen and I can do that. Uh, but I, 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 I really don't think that the screen share for the most part is necessary because people should all have their own trading software, charting software, and it should be good enough where if we're talking about a stock, you're typing it up for yourself and studying it for yourself. Um, but yeah, you know, I do, I do share the, share the, uh, share the screen. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I'm gonna have to get some more screens on a remote. So will alerts in your trades be posted here? Yeah, we try to communicate in real time our trades as much as possible. Uh, how many charts do I have on each monitor? It depends on the monitor. Some I have more than less. Anywhere from two to uh, anywhere from one to four. Really, I have six monitors here. I have six smaller monitors here at my office set up. On my remote setup, I've got two widescreen monitors. I really, really need to add a third. Where's the tech team? Tech! Tech! You know, they never come. They never come when I yell. I'm having a good year, Bob. Uh, from Chris M., what types of setups do you use most? Momentum with price fall, pullbacks, breakouts. Um, it depends on the market environment. Uh, I've always, I'm, I've been a big fan of the breakout trade for quite a while, so that's one that I do. Um, I like pullbacks when you have time frame continuity in that, in the, like, like a, like a pullback when you have time frame continuity on larger time frames to the upside. That's definitely a good one. Um, look trading names that are in play. You know, if the momentum makes sense when the vol when the volume comes in as well. So, uh, really. All the above, um, you know. And again, it definitely depends on market environment. Also, certain market environments, certain types of trades are better than others. No problem, Stevie. Glad glad that you've been part of the team. Reach out to info at t3live.com. Okay, okay. Th th thanks for that, Truett. That's uh, that's really good feedback, actually. I'm glad I do it. And, and you can always also type into here if you misheard something. I know I speak pretty fast sometimes. Occupational hazard of being from New York. Except when I'm, when I'm out west, I think I start to slow down a little bit. Start to slow down a little bit. Uh, I, I use Lightspeed. On the, for professional traders at T3 Trading Group, we have four different software options. Lightspeed, Tachyon. Uh, Sterling Trader Pro and Wex. Tachyon is cool because you can actually link other charting to it. So some people like that. Like you can use um, uh, oh, tradingview.com charts to link to the Tachyon platform. Um, but Light Lightspeed itself has decent charts and that's what I use. All right, gang, I am gonna wrap it up. Awesome day today. I made some money. Made some pretty good money. I'm happy about it. Um, hope you guys did too. Hope you guys were able to participate. And at the very least, I hope everyone is, is learning. So have a great night, everybody. Definitely going to suggest that you're looking to becoming a part of the team. See everybody tomorrow morning.